Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our session. I'm going to share my presentation here. Uh, thanks for uh, your patience as I navigate technology. Um, I hope you've all been enjoying the conference so far. I'm going to share a little bit about myself and our co-presenter will share, and then we might have a quick question for those of you attending and hopefully a great uh, presentation. And don't forget to ask questions as we go along. So my name is Katie Nye, and I'm representing our Baylor Collaborative on Hunger and Poverty. We are a 10-year-plus organization who's been focusing uh, on work in the anti-hunger space in Texas and beyond for over a decade. So our primary focus uh, is on child hunger and hunger-free community coalition work, and that's what we'll be talking about today. My role is our statewide field director, so I oversee our work in child nutrition with my uh, area of specialty being hunger-free community coalitions. And I'll let Mary introduce herself. It's great to be here with you all today. And I am the West Texas Regional Director uh, with the Baylor Collaborative on Hunger and Poverty. And if you don't try to put that on a, some kind of application, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long title. But uh, I am out in the field. Uh, I have been uh, working for BCHET for 10 years and uh, oversee several coalitions that are in my area. And also uh, I have a 23 county region plus the Lubbock region. So I kind of all of West Texas is in my area. And so I have helped uh, several coalitions to get started. And uh, I backbone a coalition that is here in San Angelo, Texas is where this field office is. So it's great to be with you all today. Thanks, Mary. All right, so uh, if you could, in the chat, since we've got a lot of folks joining, could you please share where you're from, uh, what state or city, and then if you are part of a coalition, uh, the name of that coalition, just so we can see who's with us today. So the Baylor Collaborative on Hunger and Poverty, our vision is a world without hunger with our mission being cultivating scalable solutions to end hunger. And I'll share a few of those in a moment. Our purpose is that as we're housed in a research university, we work to advance knowledge to end hunger. Our core assumption is that no one sector can end hunger alone. And the tools we use are research policy and practice. So I'm gonna be giving a little bit of a background on our hunger-free community coalition work. And then Mary's gonna share some more practical aspects of how we've incorporated shared power and collective impact into actual uh, sustainable programs and solutions. So the programs that we work on, again, our Child Hunger Outreach is one of our uh, longest standing programs, and that includes all of our work with federal child nutrition programs and expanding and maximizing those programs. So breakfast, summer meals, um, that's probably our biggest one, after school meals, and any and all solutions to increasing SNAP participation. We also have our Hunger-Free Community Coalition Network. That's what I'm gonna be sharing today. We've put this slide deck in uh, this session so that if you wanna click on each of these and look at our website and read more, you can. I'm not gonna go into super depth about those today, so please do that. Um, but I'll be sharing more about that today. Our Global Migration Project is a project with a Baylor University professor that, as you can imagine, is about the push and pull factors in migration at the Texas border. Um, it resulted in a children's book, and you can read a lot more about it and buy the book. Our research fellows program is uh, research fellows from across the country who are all experts in, um, in the space of hunger, and you can read that list on our website as well. We uh, launched a hunger data lab in 2019, so right before the pandemic. This includes data on all of our programs and projects. Um, Meals to You is maybe our best known program. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but it was a um, pilot that expanded to an emergency program during COVID, um, served 43 states and Puerto Rico, uh, focusing on the most rural communities in our country and in our state to help uh, deliver shelf-stable meals to kids in areas where the summer meals program could not operate. And then we have our Healthy Fluid Milk Initiative. And this is just what it sounds like. Uh, we're 
creating an incentive program around healthy fluid milk in retail stores in West Texas and Central Texas to uh, double your dollar essentially for healthy fluid milk in retail settings. All right, so what do we mean by shared power? We mean an ability to make decisions that are crucial to a specific outcome. And our outcome is a more food secure Texas or community um, that we're working with. The principles of shared power are place-based working. So making sure you have proximity to the location, communities, and problem that you're solving. Uh, collaborative working. So again, we can't do it alone. We don't just want one sector or one organization like a food bank to be working solely on this project. Distributed leadership. So everyone has a role, kind of demystifying the concept of traditional leadership and who are in elected leadership roles or traditional positions of power so that everyone has an investment and then thoughtful experimentation. So I think of that as creating a smart goal. So not just kind of willy nilly throwing spaghetti at the wall, but coming up with a smart goal and coming up with these sustainable solutions that are localized. This is from the Center for Public Impact, which is an organization we rely on to get a lot of information and helpful data about collective impact work. So when we talk about collective impact, it's very similar to what the Alliance and Hunger has touted for years as their work with uh, coalitions, which is a network of community members and organizations, everyone working together from different sectors to advance together using their actions to achieve systems level change. So we're looking for big impact, right? Not just one-on-one, -on -one, but creating uh, changes to some of those federal nutrition programs that we work on by focusing on local communities. Um, so the collective impact common, uh, common factors are that they always start with a common agenda. So again, uh, moving the needle on ending hunger, establishing shared measurements, so coming at data from the same basic knowledge, having the same base data, and then making sure that you're moving forward with an evaluation that everyone agrees on. Fostering mutually reinforcing activities. So it's sort of that celebrating successes. As the group starts working on something, they see that there has been benefit or success, and that motivates you to continue working. Encouraging continuous communication. That's been hard with COVID and, and Zoom calls and virtual conferences, but I think uh, when everyone has a role and there's a common goal, it, it creates an incentive and an urgency that makes people want to continue to communicate. And then having a strong backbone, and that can be difficult, but you know, forming um, a backbone for your project coalition that works for you. And we'll talk about some of those structures as we go along. So our concept of hunger-free community coalitions is, you know, learned from the Alliance to End Hunger. So I'm going to share a little bit in a moment about our entire history of coalition work, but it started back in 2009 with partnership and learning from the Alliance to End Hunger. So these are all things many of you are probably familiar with that um, you have to take action together. It's very similar. It's, it's based on those foundational principles of shared power and collective impact that we need as many people as possible who are living and close to the problem to help come up with the solutions and make an impact. So our history in Texas is that in 2009, we launched our, our entire organization. Our founders started the Texas Hunger Initiative. Uh, and we started with what we were calling food planning associations. And that was our first coalitions. Uh, then we worked on a few projects. This was a short pilot with some vistas. And by 2015, we felt confident that we could make a toolkit about how to start a coalition in your community to end hunger. We had what we called our first cohort. So this was before Zoom. So they were just on a joint phone call, walking through the toolkit and the steps to start your own coalition and strengthen existing coalitions that were ending hunger. I think we had about three coalitions at that time. In 2016, we had a redesign. We were able to have dedicated staff members to work on the strategy for our, our hunger-free communities. And we had a planning work group that formed. So they started to create their own strategic plan. In 2017, 
we um, started uh, solidifying that strategic plan and creating action around it. So we kind of had our own coalition <laughs> within our organization to strengthen this project. By 2018, we had updated our toolkit and that is the one that you see today. Um, so we launched our network. I'm gonna go over that website with you. And we have a newsletter and another cohort of five coalitions and more AmeriCorps VISTA members to support these coalitions. So essentially those VISTA members were sort of a, a paid person who was working full-time to increase the sustainability of the coalition so that they could work themselves out of that job. All right, so we in 2019 changed our name to the Baylor Collaborative on Hunger and Poverty, which is still a mouthful from Texas Hunger Initiative. Uh, by 2020, we had eight coalitions in a cohort that were virtually learning together, and they created a rapid response assessment and action tool due to COVID to be able to start quickly assessing needs in the community post-COVID and helping, uh, helping families and community members. Then in 2021, we launched our website. I'm going to go over that. It is all of our coalitions, the projects that they work on, um, many examples of their good work, a resource library, um, and ways to contact these other coalitions. We also placed 10 AmeriCorps VISTA members, and we still have that project going today. So we currently support 26 coalitions all across the state. We have seven regional offices, and we have one more plan and three perspective. So on our end, we helped initiate the launch of 12 out of those 20 coalitions. And we have been backbone or heavy coordination support for six of those. All right, so we have three areas that we work on. And this is, um, the first one is really our resource development and support strategy. So with those 20 coalitions, they have to have hunger, healthy food access as a priority, but they can do other work. They have to be action oriented or in the action phase and, and working on projects. Um, so not just raising money and then, you know, giving it to someone. Um, they will need to be multi-organization in leadership and participation. So we can't just have, oh, such and such a church leads this whole coalition and no one else is involved. Um, and when you join our network, you get to access our website, you get highlighted there, you get our newsletter, you get specified trainings, you can join the cohort, you get document development and support, funding opportunities, and then data support from us. So I'm going to show you the website. So um, I wanted to show you where our network coalitions are. Oh, sorry, goodness gracious. <laughs> Across the state of Texas. Let me zoom out so you can actually see. Um, we have our coalitions listed below, Ooh, sorry, as well. So what you can do is click on a coalition, for example, and it would take you to their site so you can read more about them when they were established. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We also have, forgive me for my technology uh, snafus, we also have a resource library on this website, and that's what I really want to talk to you all about. You can choose by topic area. So if you're interested in community assessments, how coalitions are structured or how they operate, strategic planning, data and mapping, or there's also um, the opportunity to search. So if you go to resource library, you can search for anything. So you can just type in what you're looking for. So I just wanted to highlight that. All right, so elements of a sustainable hunger-free community coalition. I'm sure, again, some of you are probably um, well-versed uh, in sustainable projects and organizations and, and building these, but um, these are the things that we have found. There's, there's nine of them that really mean your coalition is gonna be sustainable. Um, and so this is what we teach in the toolkit, and this is what I'm gonna go over. I don't wanna read it to you, but it's many of the things that we've talked about, and I'm gonna go through these in depth. So our expertise and capacity building support strategy is again to be the educators and provide that expertise and support as coalitions are developing. So we help initiate brand new coalitions in areas that don't have them. 
We provide backbone support. That can be being a fiscal agent. That can be um, on being on the leadership team for a little while. That can be helping them to walk through the entire toolkit. Um, consulting support. So maybe they're doing great on their own, but they have questions every now and again, or would like some help with information or data. Um, we develop these cohorts so that coalitions can talk to each other. They can learn from each other as they're going through the process. And then expert leadership. So we might serve on a board or a leadership team or be an active participant in a coalition. So our resource development and support strategy is this toolkit that we created, our rapid response assessment tool. We have short videos that help describe what a coalition is and how to get started. Uh, we have document development support. That means anything in our toolkit that's a document that doesn't make sense, whether it's a vision, mission, value statement or a strategic planning document we can help with, and then being in that network so that you can contact and be supported by other coalitions. So this is what our toolkit looks like. It's free and downloadable from our website. It has updated best practices and a toolkit in the back with actual templates that coalitions can use. So I'm going to go through the five steps. Our first step is recruiting participants, right? So the best practice is more than one sector being involved. And an example we have is our Burnett County Hunger Alliance. Uh, Burnett County is a relatively rural county just to the east of, of Austin, County, uh, Austin, Texas, which is Travis County where I live. And um, this organization had volunteers from one church who identified 24 different entities to approach. They set up one-on-one -on -one meetings. They had questions that they went through. And because of that personal connection, doing one-on-one -on -one meetings to find out their, um, the motivation that these organizations might have to be involved, they were able to get all of those folks to come to the first meeting of the coalition and most of them have remained engaged. And my favorite thing about this is that we then developed those questions into our toolkit and they've been used many times over and they can be adapted. Um, so this organization, you know, while they started with faith-based entities, they have their local government officials, local businesses. It's really been uh, an amazing um, multi-sector collaboration. All right, so someone's asking for the link to the toolkit in the chat. When we switch over to Mary's portion, I will pull that for you all and put it in here. All right, so step two is establishing your structure. So you've got all of these engaged folks. They're really excited. They're raring to go. How, who's gonna do what? How is this gonna work? How do we give people some accountability? So clear structure that has multiple leadership roles, mutual accountability, all important. So we have what we call here on the left side, the triangle is integrated and on the right is two-tiered. So kind of self-explanatory, but what's really great is that um, you can do either of these or your own uh, version. Um, the two-tiered structure is more common, right? There's a leadership team, there might be some um, specific, you know, length of time that you serve on the leadership team, um, specific roles that you want people to have. We usually have co-chairs, a secretary, a treasurer, your, you know, traditional roles, and that group really helps drive decision making. Um, and underneath that leadership team are action teams. And this is where multiple folks can have leadership. They, so someone can lead an action team. They can present what the action team is doing to the leadership team and get support. So that's the most common way that works. Our integrated structure is more for smaller communities or rural areas where, quite honestly, there's just not as many folks. Um, and so you might be a co-chair, but you might also be a member on one of the, the action teams or task forces around um, uh, community gardens because you have an interest and expertise in that. Um, so in that, in both situations, you know, there are action teams and there is um, traditional sort of, you know, leadership uh, titles. But the major difference I would say with that integrated structure is that it's often full consensus-based decision-making and those groups meet at the same time all together. Maybe right before the meeting, the action teams meet and then the full coalition will meet together and go through their agenda. 
All right, so planning for action. So you've got your structure, you know what you're gonna be working on, you've um, you know created the, the organization the way that it's gonna work for you. And now you're gonna come up with um, you know, what kind of action you want to take to make a difference in your community. So we use an asset-based approach to community assessment and issue development. So an asset approach is always proactive, so we don't want folks to constantly be set up to be reacting to crises, right? We want them to be set up so that when crises occur, they're ready and they have the resources and the people um, needed uh, and that they're, you know, looking at the, the bigger picture and responding not just to crises, but to overall food insecurity in their community. This focuses on existing capacity and resources. So reminding each person that they have, that they are a resource and they have knowledge and power in the community and that they can contribute something and maximizing existing resources. So that's why the more people, the better and then involving as many people as possible to make sure that you have the voice of as many uh, community members as you can. All right, so taking action requires uh, a couple of different pieces to be successful, but once you've got you know the issues that you wanna work on, your structure, um, you've got engaged people, what you want to do is create those SMART goals. So we call this a strategic action plan. We use a logic model, which sounds scary, but is really basic. And that's where we can come in and help train coalitions on how to complete that. It's really SMART goals and making sure that these are achievable goals with assigned tasks and a deadline so that people feel that urgency. And then providing opportunities for the teams to report out. So there needs to be regular communications and check-ins. If the teams feel like no one cares what they're doing or a project feels like they're not important or no one's really checking in on them or supporting them, then that project is gonna you know, fall to the wayside. So just making sure that there is constant, you know, planned times when folks are gonna share what they've been doing, struggles they've had and get support. So you want to continually to be working to engage existing coalition members, but also recruiting new ones. So as you go through tasks or hit a roadblock, you might want to adjust your logic model or your plan or invite new folks. And that's part of the, the process. So be open to making adjustments and then definitely celebrating accomplishments. That's a hard one, especially if we're doing everything virtually. Um, I think you know, again, just having that regular communication and someone to say, hey, this team did X, Y, Z this week. Let's all, you know, cheer for them. That's really important. All right. So once you've been implementing an activity, which again, Mary's going to go over some of the sustainable solutions that our coalitions have created over the years, you want to assess your progress. So you need to be regularly creating self-improvement our self-evaluation so you can improve. So an example of this is our Dallas Coalition for Hunger Solutions. They launched in 2012 after an intensive planning process. They had four action teams and they had a lot of initial success. But then by 2014, they noticed participation and energy started to wind down as they had, you know, crossed a few things off of their list. Um, and so they needed to do a self-evaluation and assess. You need to realign and figure out, okay, we did these things, what's next? You know, we're ready to tackle some new activities. So that created five new action teams. It re-energized the coalition, engaged new participants, new people in leadership, and there was success in each action team because they, you know, got back together and said, okay, we see dwindling participation and momentum, what can we do? All right, and so this is where Mary is going to share more about actual projects that our coalitions have done. So Mary, let me know when you're ready to advance slides. Okay, we'll, we'll start with that one for just a little bit. Uh, in my experience in working with hunger-free community coalitions, I found that the coalitions who seem to be the most successful have jumped in with at least one project that they can begin right away. And the reason uh, that this is helpful is that it develops camaraderie and a purpose for the group. 
uh, they're not just talking, you know, it's real important to go through that logic model and all the things that Katie has just talked about. But at some point you need to start taking action. And so these, uh, these ideas that I'm going to share with you are some ways that some coalitions across our, uh, across our state have come up with ways to take action. Um, it's important also to give everyone a responsibility whenever you're doing these coalition projects because it, that way uh, people feel needed. Uh, nobody likes to attend, keep attending meetings where they're, somebody's just telling them all the things that somebody else has already done. Uh, it's important, as Katie has mentioned, it's important to have that collaborative aspect where everybody gets an opportunity to uh, share their ideas or ways that they think we, they could improve. Uh, all of those kinds of things are very important. So one project that I wanted to share with you is uh, from the Tom Green County Hunger Coalition. And this is one that we, uh, this is the, the coalition that I backbone. So uh, because we have uh, had such good success with this, and I'm going to hold up, this right here is what I'm talking about. This is our uh, San Angelo Pocket Resource Guide. We have shared that idea with several coalitions in our area, and all of them have ju really jumped on that as a way of getting started. And what it is, is that it is a list of resources of all types in the community. Of course, we're interested in hunger and food resources, and that's all on there. But we also have included things like child care and disability support and employment training, veteran services, health services, housing, support services, legal aid, substance abuse, and public transportation. Because a lot of times the folks that are also food insecure are also looking for some of these other uh, resources as well. We started out by having a map on our pocket guide and each one of the resources had a number and we had corresponding numbers to those uh, to those agencies on our map, but we decided this last revision, which we have just done, that uh, we had so many things we wanted to put on the guide and our community is not so large that we felt like people could find it, uh, find where that agency was just by the address. So we have made that change. But as you can see, whenever I held it up, it can it's folded up and can be the size of a kind of a, of a credit card, easily put in someone's wallet or, uh, in someone's purse. And the second one is uh, from another county that's close by, and this is McCulley County Hunger Coalition. And uh, this, uh, I was kind of got, I'm going to kind of give you some tips along the way. And one thing that this uh, project shows is that partnering with other organizations is always a plus. And so the Crockin for Kids is the organ is the project that we are talking about for them. It's a nutrition education project for kids. Although I think uh, that it could easily be adapted for senior adults or other groups, but they are teaching nutrition uh, with this one at an early age. They're doing it as an after school project uh, for second graders through fifth graders. Uh, Texas A&M AgriLife is the partner with this one and uh, they come in and have been teaching some nutrition, some cooking skills, mostly to try to get kids to be able to uh, cook on their own. And by using crock pots rather than the stove, it's a little bit safer. And uh, then at the end of the session, they had a few weeks of classes. And at the end of the classes, they were able to give every child a crock pot uh, to take home so that they could do at home what they'd been doing in class. So that was a, a great project. It was uh, to gain knowledge and skills to make healthy, affordable meals at home. Then the next one is a new project to us. Uh, you may know about it already, but uh, the Abilene Big Country Hunger Coalition in Abilene, Texas has done this one. And the, if this is a swap or supporting wellness at pantries. And I think this is a great idea of, uh, because in all of our work, we're concentrating on uh, promoting healthy foods and nutrition. So this one does that for sure. It's a stoplight nutrition ranking system that is done in the pantry and uh, they categorize all foods as 
uh, green, yellow, or red based on its nutritional value. Now this is particularly helpful for those pantries where uh, the recipients get to shop uh, instead of just getting a box of something. They, they're trying to teach them the nutritional values of food and get, encourage them to choose the most nutritional value, the most nutritional foods. Okay, uh, the next, if we can go to the next slide, Katie. It's always great if uh, your project has some parameters. Uh, now, so we do have a lot of projects that are ongoing forever, but uh, when you first start, sometimes it's good to have where the, the people in your coalition can kind of see where the beginning and where the end is so that they don't feel like they're signing on for life to do this particular project. And our Kids Eat Free program uh, that the Tom Green County Hunger Coalition does is uh, kind of falls in that category. It is providing, it's a privately funded summer meal program that is provided by pre predominantly churches. And we worked with the school district, so we had some collaboration with that in finding where the neighborhoods of greatest need were. And we did that based on the numbers that the school district had for various schools for the free and reduced lunch uh, participants. And so we chose the ones that had the highest numbers of people in free and reduced lunch. And we chose those neighborhoods and then we sought out partners uh, that were actually in those neighborhoods that could provide a meal site. And that has continued. We've actually just had our 13th year of doing that, but it started out as knowing that it was going to be a, a five or six week time period from the time school quit serving their meals at the end of June uh, until school started in the fall. So it ended up being about five or six weeks that was, we always start the week after the 4th of July or the week of the 4th of July and go up till the time school starts. But it is a definite period of time that uh, people are committing to those churches that adopt a site are committing to uh, purchase, prepare and serve the food. And also we ask them to provide activities so that the kids can have a good time. It's summer and we want them to have fun as well. But uh, we have some parameters of starting and ending times on that. Then the next one is uh, the Burnett County Hunger Alliance has a project that is a really good example uh, that pooling resources is a way of maximizing and leveraging the resources in the community. And you can see from the slide there that they have a mobile food pantry in a food desert area, food desert neighborhood. And uh, so that meant that there was really no food available close by and no grocery store, or, and it was a significant distance to any other food source. So the re recipients decided to get together and uh, work together and volunteers were provided an opportunity to help those in need in their own backyard. So, but it was a cooperative effort. You can see there that the fire department owned the land. Uh, another organization provided the protein items, the youth group, uh, sacked the food and uh, gave out the food. Individuals provided the large electronic signs and then neighbors let them put them in their yard. So it was a big uh, collaboration uh, project. And then you can also, uh, next slide, Katie, uh, is the Dallas Hunger Solutions has a project called Eating Well as a Snap. And this is a good example where that you could, for your projects, you might pick just a particular segment of the community. And um, in this case, they used a volunteer team as presenters. But what it is, is that it's an interactive presentation uh, uh, for low-income seniors designed to assist them in eating well on a very limited budget. And uh, they include food the, in their presentation, they include which foods to eat for a balanced diet and how to purchase those foods uh, more economically. They share a variety of resources, including information about SNAP, which is a financial assistance program that seniors can use to supplement their uh, grocery budget. And then not only do they tell people about SNAP, <clears throat> but they also have someone there at the presentation that is uh, eligible to be able to sign someone up for SNAP. So they can immediately uh, 
try to apply for that resource. And then uh, working with local food banks is also another tip that brings many opportunities. And the last one there, Smith County Food Security Council, uh, is, uh, has a community resource roadshow. And they partner with the East Texas Food Bank and they have a time where they have a fresh produce drop and they have uh, health screenings and provide job support and other benefit assistance like WIC. And all of those things are provided uh, at the roadshow and they try to do this once a month. So this is a, another great idea. Another couple of projects, uh, since we have just a little bit of time that I wanted to share with you that are other projects we did one uh, called Outrun Student Hunger because a lot of people overlook the fact that college food insecurity is a really big issue. And we wanted to do something to highlight that so that the whole community was aware. Uh, a lot of times people think, oh, college students, you know, they, they manage just fine. You know, they can eat at the cafeteria on campus and all of that, but a lot of kids, have used all the money that they have to be able to uh, pay the tuition, buy their books and, and, and just live. And so we wanted to highlight the fact that the university here had a food pantry and many universities do have a food pantry, but we have found in our research that a lot of places, the, the students are really not aware of where that food pantry is and really don't know about it. And so we wanted to do this, uh, it was a little 2K event that we invited the community to come to the campus. And we ended our, uh, our run at the food pantry to highlight where it was and the food service department of Angelo State University provided a, a really light lunch to go with that. So that's another uh, quick idea. Another thing that we've done is uh, blessing boxes. Uh, these are like little libraries but we've located those around in neighborhoods of the greatest need. And those, uh, we put uh, shelf stable food in those. We have several food drives, uh, th either through churches or we have one uh, annual food drive that provides a lot of that food. Plus the churches where these are located, uh, adopt those and they can put shelf stable food in them periodically through the week for those folks in need that can just stop by and get what they need. And we always say, take what you need, take what you can, leave, leave take what you need, leave what you can. And uh, it's worked out great. We have 13 of those around our community. But those are just a couple of extra ideas that we didn't put on the slide. But anyway, you can see that there's a variety of projects that can be done. Uh, and it's really important to partner with other organizations to concentrate on things that provide uh, healthy food and nutrition. To sometimes have a beginning and an end or defined um, parameters with your project to in, include everyone in the decision making and in the planning process and give people jobs so that they feel needed and to maximize and leverage any resources that you have that can help with any of their projects. Um, and uh, working with your food bank is a great uh, opportunity too. And, uh, you can choose different aspects of the community, different groups within the community and highlight those. But it's uh, a working together and very important that all the coalitions have representation from all aspects of the community. So we appreciate y'all being with us and we are happy to share these ideas. Any questions? Feel free to pop them in the Q&A or chat and we'd be happy to answer. I do want to help make a distinction that, um, you know, one of our areas of uh, focus is policy. And you probably didn't hear us talk a lot about policy with our coalitions. We see a distinction between what, what's usually called a food policy council and what our hunger-free community work currently is. Um, we certainly have food policy councils across the state. Um, they are not in our network. Those are not what we started. Those are typically groups, right, that are um, giving recommendations for local or state policy. Um, and so I see, you know, collaboration and partnership there, but we don't um, have them in our network since they don't typically do what Mary was describing as these sort of 
um, on the ground solutions or projects. They're, they're suggesting policy changes. So in case anyone had a question about that, um, that's why we, we don't have anything that's, you won't probably see anything called a policy council that is in our network at this time, um, but they definitely collaborate with our coalitions. Any questions? You also see our email addresses there, so you can follow up with us at any time. I will say that the um, the toolkit in the state that it's in is going to be changing, hopefully in the next three months or so, where it will be digital and it will be online so that you can um, just pull out sections that you need. It's not going to just be one long PDF. It'll be a, come into this uh, this age and time where we need it to be more interactive and easier to access. So um, pay attention to our social media website or email us if you have questions about that because a newer version will be coming. Katie, Mary, while folks are pondering their questions, I wanted to highlight a couple of places that folks were, were uh, tuning in from. You have uh, attendees tuning in from Chico, California, Albany, New York, a national organization, Northwest Georgia, Denver, Colorado, Southern Arizona, and the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. Amazing. Wow. Well, like I, like I explained with, I think, Hunger, um, with our Meals to You program, that's probably where we've had the most interaction with those states. Um, but it's really exciting to have so many people from across the country. I'm trying to go back and see if anyone was with a coalition. I'm not sure. Another thing I might say is that we are always open for ideas. So mm -hmm. if you have an idea, if you are with a coalition and you have a great idea that you can share, I always tell the coalitions that I work with that there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. If we uh, can share ideas with each other, that is the best. And uh, so we, we really encourage you to share with us if you have any ideas that you think, oh, y'all could y'all could do this. And we have a, a very large and diverse state that we work in. And so what works in the Metroplex might not work in rural West Texas, but sometimes it does just by some kind of uh, just, you know, tweaking it just a little bit, it, the same things can work. But we would love to hear your ideas as well. So you might not have a question, but if you have an idea of a project that you're uh, working with or that you're aware of, we have a little bit of time and we'd love to hear from you uh, about that project. I do see a Mary, question actually. Do you see that too, Ray? I do. So Linda Kramer posted, I like the idea of working on a project to get the coalition going. What I've found is sometimes there are dis disagreements between organizations. Some want to focus directly on hunger relief and others want to want to address root causes. How do you suggest dealing with this kind of tension within, within a coalition? Uh, I, was say, I have thoughts, but Mary, I didn't know if you wanted to go first. Uh, okay, I, I couldn't hear the last part of the question. I'm sorry. I, she said sometimes they have conflicts and something. What was that at the very end? The, the tension between um, hunger relief and addressing root causes. Okay. How do you deal with the tension between those two ideas? Well, one, I, I fully understand what you're talking about because uh, we've actually been struggling with that too. Our, our mission statement is that we are working on food for today, tomorrow, and a lifetime uh, is our mission statement for our coalition. And we've just recently been thinking about the idea that we, we do pretty well with the today and tomorrow uh, ideas, but the for a lifetime is, uh, is something that we're needing to work on. Uh, so we've, we've tried to meet the immediate needs, I guess, is what we have been doing with what we've done so far. And to and try to get also working with a project that we're working with at BCHIP is we have a grant from AARP to try to work with seniors uh, signing up for SNAP, which would be a little bit more you know, like for tomorrow. But for a lifetime, I think that's where we need the, 
uh, to do more work in teaching some of those skills that can get people up and out of that project. We had a couple of um, ideas that there's a food pantry that we had uh, to present at our one of our summits that's from Montana. And they were able to utilize a kitchen that was at their food pantry to uh, teach some cooking skills that the people were then able to use to get jobs in the food industry. And so that was, and then I've got another coalition that was trying to do some things that, uh, because to get a better job these days, uh, having technical skills, knowing how to use computers and programs on computers and things is important. And so they were going to uh, have that as a, one of their efforts is to try to teach some computer skills so get, people could get better jobs. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear what you, what you, how you all handled that as well. And Katie may have some ideas as well. Yeah, no, I think that's um, a core issue. That's what I wrote in the chat. So I'm glad you brought that up. And I think, um, you know, that's why uh, having local coalitions is so helpful because it can kind of be both and when needed and either or when needed. So you have some coalitions where it really is like Mary was saying, what's the vision, mission, values? And what I'm really trying to, to preach or tell coalitions to do is have a decision matrix. And you know, if the project or idea fits within, you know, your vision, mission, values, you have the quote unquote resources or, you know, you can get them. And, you know, what are the, the core things that it has to meet to be able to do the project? And sometimes that transparency alone can help people go, okay, my project wasn't picked and that was why. And that might help. Um, another thing is separate them into action teams. You know, I think root causes is a really good um, thing that a lot of people are are passionate about, but going upstream can be hard. I think it's good to educate oneself about those root causes, but with some community members, um, having that education and then starting small helps them to be engaged. And so having an action team, I don't mean small as in ineffective or not helpful, but doing something like a blessing box just to come together, you know, kind of practice the process of planning, executing a project and seeing the effectiveness of it and evaluating it, that can be really valuable. So in McCullough County, they created blessings boxes, but they didn't just put them out there and, and let them happen. They did an evaluation because community members wanted to know, you know, kind of there was a NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard, you know, who, what, who's coming to this and taking, you know, they're taking this from people who might really need it. And they found out it was a lot of single mothers and they needed formula. And they, so there were things that weren't in there that they needed. So they getting that feedback helped them to evaluate, do more. So again, starting up with a smaller project and then you know learning who your clients are and then engaging with them helped the coalition. Now they're creating a food hub. So they realized that there was a need, a larger need in the community, right? But they had to start small. So I do think it can be both and, but you're right, sometimes, there are times when some people just are going to leave. They might not be engaged. If the group really wants to follow root causes, those, um, you know, people who want to do uh, immediate, you know, food uh, support might do something else. So it, it happens. I think it's tricky. Another thing I might uh, just reiterate, uh, Katie mentioned it in some of her slides, was the asset-based community development. And this might be another good way to do it, to, to find out what those causes are. You really need to talk to the people that are in, that are food insecure and go into neighborhoods and empower those neighborhoods to uh, take some action as well. Instead of us deciding, well, we think your neighborhood needs this or that, instead of doing it that way to go actual have town hall meetings or small group meetings or focus groups or whatever you want to do to find out what the people themselves actually feel like is their greatest need instead of just trying to you know decide on our own what we think it is so i think that's another thing that you could you know ask your folks that 
feel differently about some of that, you know, say, well, we need that research, just like Katie was saying, we need the research, but we just need to emphasize the fact that we need to talk to the people that are actually in need and find out what they think they need. Thanks, Mary. And that was a great question. You're making my brain is going off. We're hoping to create a series of um, kind of uh, foundational trainings, you know, to to talk about these issues. And I think this could be something that we bring up in one of our, you know, initial trainings where there's some of our expert um, folks that are research and faculty fellows talking about what food insecurity is, you know, what what that dynamic is and how to combat it. So that's great. Um, I think, if, are there any other questions? If not, we can give you a couple of minutes back. So I think um, I just want to say thanks again. And again, Mary and I are here. Mary's got lots of experience at this. This is her area of expertise. We have other folks on our team that aren't here today, but we shared examples of coalitions they've started or worked on. So please reach out to us if you want to be directly connected to any of the examples you heard um, or if you have questions about our process. But I will kick it back to Ryan. Katie. Thank you, and Mary, thank you for sharing your expertise and experience with us today. Up next is a 30-minute break and an opportunity to check out our on-demand content in the lobby. We'll then begin our next set of four workshop sessions that will address establishing healthy connections in child and retailer food health. To join one of these four sessions, click Workshops in your navigation bar to the left of your screen. You can view all four workshops being offered by clicking the blue arrow to the right, then click enter the session. A reminder that one of the upcoming workshops called Expanding Healthy Food Options at Retailers will be, will be, will be presented in Spanish. English interpretation will be available for this session. That concludes our workshop. To exit the session, please click on the red phone icon at the bottom of your screen now and then click leave. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks all.